during the interview what he feels for his dad and it all comes out in that movie that's that's his life that's his blood yeah. that's twisted into his dna and the noobster as we used to call him when he raced with the jim busby porsche bfg 962 team he has a lot of fun with this stuff and it shows There's Mike right there in the 89. They've already given him a big hill to climb. He's not right next to a Corvette. <laughs> well, he was joking around about it earlier when he came up to the booth after the first race this morning. He goes, well, played all my hand in the first race. He goes, uh, a couple of guys didn't see a couple of things I did, took advantage of it, got around eight or so guys. He goes, problem is, use up all my cards. He's got nothing left to play, he said. Do you believe that for a moment? No. I've, I've known Mike way too long. Do you believe long. that? I'll tell you what. He does. One, he did one thing that very few other guys out here have done. He read the rule book. Yeah. And that's how he did that this morning, by being legal and right. Only thing is, as you get a little bit further up the grid, you get to that pointy end of the stick, it gets a little harder because some of those other guys got a pretty few good tricks as well well they've been as you said earlier they've been driving these cars for a long time and you get to sea level pretty quickly in a class as fat with talent horsepower and torque as this look at all these gt 350s with a different stripe and color scheme fantastic it's nice to be 18 years old again i like it i still like the traditional white with the blue, blue so of course you do those are america's racing yep. colors blue upon white and, and a lot of people don't necessarily know that story so uh, i'll let you explain it well it, the fia assigned everybody the fia is the international federal federation internationale automobile in paris and after the war when the fia was founded everybody got assigned a national color now before the war the aiacr or RC, I can never get that straight, assigned everybody colors. Do you know what the first color assigned to America was long, long, long before World War One? Very few people. I told Dr. Panos this, and his eyes bugged out. Well, I, I don't. It was red. Red. And the Italian Automobile Club threw a fit. Was it a different shade of red or just red? And red. Red. Because you wow. used to have the chassis, the, the body, the chassis, and the wheels were all different colors. It would be like white, black, and red, or uh -huh. green. And the Italians were not happy, made their displeasure known, and the IACR said, all right, fine. We'll give it to you. And America got blue upon white. And that's what it is. And that's why. There's white upon blue. That also works, but blue and white. And if you look at the emblem of the Road Racing Drivers Club, you will see America. You will see America's colors and a checkered flag. So if you see somebody wearing a little pin, looks like a steering wheel. Speaking of steering wheels, they're working on it because we're racing. Come on, Mike. I'm very partisan. I was rooting for Bill, now I'm going to root for Mike. Couple of Corvettes and a Cobra battle, and the red Corvette getting a little loose in the back end. And how far back is Mike, or is he making up any ground? He's in the midst of the pack. There he is coming to the inside, coming out of Andretti. He's going to get himself a spot right there. So A sedan passes B production. Hmm. Wonder how that happened. Now he's going to take off after that Corvette. Go get him, Mike. He's going to come right by our booth as he goes to the inside at turn four. We're going to be drivers left to him right about there. Now he's got the challenge of holding that thing down for turn five. And our leaders are climbing the hill. Cobra out in front of four Corvettes, or three Corvettes, and then another Cobra, looks like. That is the order, Cobra. Corvette, 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 Cobra. And then another Cobra behind that. So there's your top six. John Morton looks like he's doing pretty good in that sun being Tiger. I just love here. Can you tell the difference between a Chevy VS small block and a, and a Ford 289? I, I think I think I can. I can't. You can? I can't. I really can't. I would like to think I can. Maybe I'm just fooling myself, but I think I can. I'm pretty sure I can get the difference between a Porsche and a Ferrari. Mike got around that Corvette. Let's see if he can hang on. Very nice line, Michael. A little bit defensive, but certainly very fair and very proper. 
Fight for second is a pretty good one. At the sharp end, as you say. Yeah. And when there's Cobras and Corvettes, it's pretty pointy. <laughs> no doubt about it. Yeah, buddy. Our lead car, number 96, is Lord Libel. Car that raced extensively in SCCA competition in its day. Boy, is he going to have some home movies with that onboard camera he's carrying? Well, that was one of the things we talked about yesterday. You can see him sticking out and popping up off of all of these cars, all, all of these drivers. They want to capture every little bit of everything they've done behind the wheel. You know, you have all these original components on these cars and then all these modern little cameras sticking out everywhere. Can you blame them? No. Wouldn't you want to have this? do the same thing. I just want one of the cars. I've got the camera. <laughs> I need the car. Kyle Kelly is in that 66 Corvette, the red one that's running in second place, number 32. A car that was built by Carlos Arroyo in San Francisco. Changed hands quite a few times. Did a lot of racing up in the Northwest. Now it's doing a lot of vintage racing, including here and down in Coronado. There's a big vintage race down there in the San Diego area. Great race on, great race on the airport down there, and that's very much out of the 50s. But Kyle's, Kyle's oh, getting comfortable. That car is under him. Yeah, he's got competition to the inside. Look at this. Side by side, two Corvettes. That's a 65 and Corvette, the white one with the blue stripes. Those are gentlemen racers, and they're being gentlemanly about it, but they're not giving an inch. This what? is great road racing. You just want to make sure the tires don't slip when you're trying to be jumping in the lead. You don't slide into the guy next to you. Well, for guy like you or me, guys like you or me who've seen big, fat Formula One tires, these things look skinny when you go down and look at them. Oh, here we go. Inside at five. Hard on the brakes. Working it. Working it. Oh, boy. Just got the rear end past the nose of the other one. And then back up alongside. Here he comes. And he's got the line. Yeah, going into six. Kyle's got the line. Big advantage on the inside. They're watching both drift very wide at the exit there. And thundering up the hill they go. Still chasing the Cobra. That's starting to gap them a little bit. You don't want to lose it on that turn. If you go out of the park on that turn, you end up in Salinas. Boy, look at those things. Slide in and then down the corkscrew. That has got to be a lot of fun. The next time somebody tries to tell you that vintage and historic racing isn't real racing, I want you to remember this moment. Keeping it on in the 97 there, that's the 1962 Shelby Cobra 289, 10th Cobra ever built. It was raced by the Shelby team, the rack and pinion cars. That battle for second place just doesn't seem to want to go away. That car is actually shown over at Pebble Beach. That is a, gr a great honor in and of itself. Yeah, if you're a Cobra guy, that is one to pay attention to right there. I've always been a bigger fan of the fastback version of the Mustangs, too, in this era. I think they look great. Well, they do. They're very attractive cars, and those lines have held up very well. Very well indeed. Of course, I'm old enough that I had a 67 Mustang fastback. It looked very much like Stephen Queen's bullet must have passed back. There's still a lot of traffic here as Steve Park works through there in his Cobra. And he's got company on the outside in that number 91. Tim Park's got his 63. Been a club racer for quite a few years. Now he's an extensive amount of Vintage racing. Hard racing, clean racing all the way down in the 20, into the 20th position. This is wonderful Steve on a perfect out. Monterey day. Yeah. Tim out of Santa Barbara, California. And you see that there's a black and gold Mustang at the back of that picture. Mike Joy now running in 24. He's just shadowing these guys, and every now and then he'll stick his nose in the picture. Look, he's having a great time with it. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you kidding me? He's got that big Ford V8 on him. He's having a great time. And look, he's in front of he's in front of some fastbacks. B production cars with that A sedan. Good job, Michael.
Justin, I think this is one of the classes I've had the most fun with all weekend. Hey guys, I was just thinking when you were talking about the talks group. Do you remember two or three years ago, or I know Mike would remember this, I raced in a 1966 Ford Galaxy stock car. It had a division just for those cars here. And drum brakes, something I'm not overly familiar with. And looking at these cars go around, I really have an empathy for the drivers. With those drum brakes, if you break literally one foot past the ideal brake point, they don't work very well. I was leading the field, coming up to the corkscrew, braked a couple of feet late, thought maybe I shouldn't spin it, because it certainly wasn't going to stop, so I rolled down the other side. Memo to self, never go racing in a 966 Ford uh, Galaxy stock car, <laughs> equally never don't go racing through the corkscrew. It was brilliant. Great round clearance and straight across the ground. <laughs> Great story, and you can just hear the roar through Justin's microphone. As this pack goes through, you're going to catch a glimpse of a green Mustang. Here's our race leader back at the front, Libel. And the great battle of American A Production Road Racing, Corvette versus Cobra. Coming up to lap a Mercury Caliente, Comet Caliente. Listen to the scream out of that Cobra. That engine started life to be designed to be a pickup truck motor. 221 cubic inch pickup truck motor, then a 260, then 289, and so on and so forth. But a little truck motor. Needless to say, it wouldn't have been... Le Whoa, baby! Trying hard. <laughs> yeah. Needless to say, that little truck motor wouldn't have become a legendary power plant that it is if it had only stayed in those trucks. That little truck motor that's the world champion. Well, and one of the Corvettes off at the top of the corkscrew. Local yellow only, which is good. Oh, the oil flag, the slippery track flag is being shown as well. And that's Craig Carter, 64. Craig looks like he's just getting ready to pull back in the race. Working lap seven of probably eight or nine laps, depending yeah. upon the time. So we're getting close. He's got a great view, though. Once everybody come down through the hill. If he can get it out of the sand and out onto the racetrack, he can coast it from there all the way down to the pit lane. Well, I've seen it done. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm dead serious when I said that. I've seen it done. Tiger. Number 65 is a little sunbeam tiger. No, 1965. Quite a bit of club and vintage racing in that car. I always thought they were attractive cars, and that one ended up with, with the, when the Roots Group was bought by Chrysler, they took the Fords out and put Chrysler 273 engines in. We were talking about the Hertz cars. This one right here, that Mustang we just saw, was a 66 Shelby GT350 Mustang with a very few original white and gold stripe Hertz Rena racers right there. You wanted to rent it, you had to go to the San Francisco airport to get that particular car. Is right that right? There, that's on the racetrack, yeah. No kidding. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. It was actually stolen and then recovered in 67. I was wondering if that would be a problem, because I remember Hertz had something called the Sports Car Club, and you had to be a member of the Sports Car Club to rent a, a Shelby uh, Mustang. Looks like one of our Mustangs calling it a day. Now that little green Mustang just at the front of the red one there. See it just going into 11 there? Yes. Right there. Interesting story on that car. It's a 1966 Shelby GT350. That too was a Hertz car. It was purchased from the Hertz Corporation in 66. The owner actually has the original pink slip and it says Hertz Corp on it as the uh, original owner of the car. That's very important when you're doing automotive archaeology and you're trying to validate your vehicle. Make sure you get all the paperwork you can get on it, whether you race the car or not. If you're doing a restoration for a competition of any kind or just to own the car, do the paperwork. 
and then come out to a place like this, race it, and win. And you can say, not only is it a great car with a great history, but it's also a vintage racing champion. And that, too, will add a lot of... You know, it doesn't do any harm, that's oh, for no. sure. Oh, no. What provenance added to it? Mike's continuing to wheel his way along. He's picked up a couple spots. Up to 22nd now. Well, considering he started 33rd, I would say a 33% improvement is pretty, pretty good indeed. Battle for the lead is still a good one, too. They're running out of time. Last time up the hill headed for Salinas. Just don't go there. I remember one time a Can-Am car went off right there and ended up in a tree. I watched Wayne Gardner go off there in a 500 GP bike one time, too. I don't, all the way through. I don't even want to think about that. Wayne wasn't a big fan of that quarter for a while. <laughs> the Europeans really weren't that crazy about this place on motorcycles simply because it's very, very technical on a bike. And it was a huge advantage for the Americans for years because of it. Indeed. I'll bet you these guys are coming to the checkered flag. We're getting about there. We're working lap nine. We've got to be close. These guys know it. They've got to be close. And they're trying hard in that Corvette sliding some more. A little bit of oversteer. Gordon Leibel in his 1965 Cobra. Comes out of the final corner. Oh, he gets a little loose. Wiggle. Don't lose it now. Ah, he straightens it out. Ooh, good. One more. We one get more another one. Told. We oh, get another okay. one. That's great. Well, there's a bunch of traffic in front of them, too. But I'm not so sure they're going to catch it. We'll see. Maybe going up the hill. Boy, our Corvette pretty good through the middle of the corner. Good news, Michael. you got another lap to go. Yeah. John Morton, by the way, is running up in 10th. Mike lost his spot. He slipped back to 23rd. Chance to gather it back up here. Boy, this Corvette is really hounding Libel. The Stewart is right there. Tom Stroud about everything he knows in that 75 Corvette, and that's a B production car chasing an A production Cobra. That didn't happen very often. And he's given the steering box in that thing a real workout, too. Well, he's, Boy, he's at it from the right to the left. Look at, just look at that. Sliding look at through that. His six. And it cost him. It cost him. It did. He lost some time there. Now he's going to pitch it down the hill as they run into the corkscrew. Let's see what he can do here. Kelly's still running back there in third. But tidier this time through. Now that traffic might come into play just as they get into 11. We'll see what that does. Oh, boy. He slid it all the way out of Rainey. The Corvette. And into 10. Yeah, the Jaguar's going to be in front of him, giving him all plenty of room. Libel drives right down the middle of the race course. Yeah. Right in the middle. He did it just right this time. Perfect. Couldn't have been better. And he's going to get the win. Libel will take the checkers here in 4B. 1963 to 66. GT cars over 2,500 cc. Well, Tom Stoyer, 1B production. That's the way I'm going to tell this story from <laughs> now on. A production was won by a Cobra, B production was won by a Corvette. Coming up after this group is Group 5B. Now, we saw some of the Formula Junior cars earlier. We're going to get the rest of the field here. 61 to 63 Formula Junior cars, disc brake cars. This is when Britain stood up as a world power in motorsport. Whoa. Tail end of the group, finishing up their final lap. And Mike is still showing in 23rd. Let's see if he can... Get one spot back here. Bunch of Mustangs in this group right here. That's a tough go for a, for, a, for a, an A sedan to take a B production. Shelby Mustang is really, really a hard, deep, deep, cold pool to swim in. Up to the course group for the final time. Looks like you're driving off the end of the earth when you go up there. Feels like it, too, when you turn left. Really? In there and it just drops away from you. Been through it on a motorcycle and in a car, and it's just an incredible sensation in both. I'm such a weenie that I lift it off on a golf cart. <laughs> that tells you what it's like driving up that hill. Well, it's going to be permagrin for Mike when he completes this race. 
Well, he started 33rd, and now he's 23rd. Would you be embarrassed with 10 positions? No No way. Not only that, it was a lot of fun, I guarantee you. Well, the good thing is he's going to be back here when the earth moves later this afternoon. Good end of the day for these guys, and Mike Joy gets credited with 24th. Ah, still good. Okay, he only picked up 10 places. Gee, or 9, or whatever. That's that's an that's a massive improvement. Big part of the thunder here at the Rolex Monterey Motorsports reunion as we work our way through day two. Ralph Shaheen, Chuck Dressing, Justin Bell, and now 24th place finisher Mike Joy as well. He'll be making his way back to the booth. I wonder what he. I wonder where he finished in a sedan. I'll have to look at that. Maybe that'll make him that feel better. Him I'll have to look and see where he finished in a sedan. And once again, Michael, being the very gallant '60s driver, waving to the the marshals, the corner workers, and the crowd. That's the way it's supposed to be done. Well, before Mike got into his driver suit, he uh, worked with the rest of us on our mother's polish's favorite car. As we all went around the paddock, picked out our favorite cars. Hmm. 